Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, just uh, to let you know that we're, we're all here and ready to go soon, but we're just gonna wait a few minutes to um, get the rest of the people on board and to figure out a few things. So if you can all just hold tight for another five minutes and then we'll get started. Thank you. You all right, Heather? It's all beef, it's all good, all good. All right, thanks for that, Emily. So welcome, everybody. Um, so my name is Kayleigh Garthway. I'm a lecturer and a researcher at the University of Birmingham in the UK. So this is our third webinar in a series that's been organised by Why Hunger, Fien International and the Independent Food Aid Network. So in the series of webinars, we've aimed to address some important questions around charity and food aid that are emerging in North America and Europe. And so far, we've been discussing some of the contradictions that are inherent in responding to some of the immediate needs of people and communities who are struggling with hunger and poverty, while at the same time advocating that the state should be upholding its duty to protect, to respect and fulfil the right to adequate food, to housing and a dignified life. So some of the other questions we've been covering in the last few seminars are thinking around can actually can the provision of charity and the fight for social justice and human rights coexist? And what are some of the emergent strategies to resist in the corporate capture of food charity? I think today we're going to be focusing on how we can best amplify the voices and wisdom of those who are living with poverty, with food poverty, day in, day out, to forge that new path and change the narrative on how to end hunger from one that relies on charity as a solution to one that calls for organising and building power and grounding solutions in social justice and a rights-based framework. So today we're going to be speaking, we're going to be hearing from people who are describing their experiences with food banks and food pantries and sharing their vision for a society that's rooted in this concept of a right to food. And each speaker today will be um, speaking alongside a representative of an organisation or institution that supports and organises alongside them. Next slide, please, Emily. Thank you. So I just want to give just a little bit of an introduction and context um, about me and my own work before I hand over to the speakers. So in my own research, I've been carrying out um, research for the last 10 years on issues around poverty, inequality, disability and stigma. Um, and more recently, the last five years looking at food insecurity, food bank use. So I use qualitative and ethnographic methods and always sort of prioritising the voices of people who are experiencing poverty day to day. 
So in 2013, I started volunteering at, um, and carrying out research at a Trussell Trust food bank in the northeast of England. Um, and for those of you who don't know, the Trussell Trust is um, a Christian charity and they are the largest food bank franchise in the UK. So not long after I began volunteering, um, for the very first time, the amount of um, food parcels that were given out um, by the Trussell Trust actually reached over one million. Um, and at that time, there was a lot of discussion in the media around the numbers and statistics of people who were using them. But what I found was actually there wasn't really a discussion of the lived experience or the voices of people who were using them. And so at that point, I'd been involved with the food bank as a volunteer for around about 18 months. I'd spoken to hundreds of people who use the food bank. Um, I'd also interviewed all the volunteers, staff at referral agencies. And so what I decided to do at that point was um, all, all the data, all the information that I got so far was to write um, book Hunger Pains, which you can see on the slide there, just to focus on the stories and experiences of people using food banks. And so in my own work, I've always tried to make sure I sort of share research findings um, and key messages sort of just beyond the academic community. So, so working with frontline providers, third sector organisations, but also grassroots organisers, activists, and as well people with lived experience. Um, next slide, Emily, please. And so I just want to talk a little bit about um, a conference, a two day workshop that I organised last November and um, where actually some of the people who we're going to be hearing from today came along to this workshop and, and I got to hear about some of their great work there. Um, but yeah, I organised this event to learn, to see, really sort of learn what we can, what we can learn from um, the sort of transatlantic context here in the UK and also vice versa. So sort of a, a mutual learning process was going on there. Um, and the event, it wasn't simply um, focusing on bringing together academics, it was sort of half academics and the other half of um, the people who came along were um, experts by experience, frontline providers, third sector organisations and grassroots organisations as well. And so I just want to talk um, now about a couple of the, um, yeah, sorry, not next slide. Yeah, I was going to say next slide, but not yet. Yeah, just some of the things that I've learned then in, in sort of carrying out research and working with people who are experts by experience. Um, one of the things to me is that actually core design and core delivery are central to involving experts by experience in any sort of um, research projects, making sure you can really sort of empower people and evolve them from the very beginning. Um, and it shouldn't just be a case of, you know, you're deciding to work with experts by experience just to take a particular box. It really should be something that, you know, you're very committed to from the beginning of the research. And it also it's something that should not end once once the research is over. There should be a focus on sustained engagement. And as well, one of the reasons, it, another reason it's important to involve experts by experience is, you know, they know what has worked, what hasn't worked. And they have an understanding at that grassroots level about the impact that services and strategies actually have on their daily lives. So it's really difficult um, for academics and others, um, if not impossible, for those who haven't actually you know, been living in poverty to truly understand the realities of living day-to-day -day life in poverty. And I think it's really important to, to consider this, especially when we look at, um, if we think of the damaging and inaccurate narratives that we often hear around poverty from politicians, in the media, from the general public as well. I think having that, um, you know, the testimonies of people who were experts by experience is even more important. And next slide, Emily, please. And so in a UK context, then one example um, of, of how um, people with experience, with lived experience of being sort of mobilising is around um, various what we call poverty truth commissions. And so basically they involve a group of civic and business decision makers and experts by experience who meet up together, build relationships, share experiences and then think about how we can actually respond to poverty more effectively. And poverty truth commissions work under the, this guiding principle that nothing about us without us is for us. And so Basically, no policy should be decided without the actual direct participation of the people who are likely to be affected by that policy. And so to this end, it's important then that we strive to build these reciprocal, mutually beneficial relationships with charities and community groups who are working around food insecurity and poverty. Next slide, please. So some of the questions I'm personally interested in exploring today and hearing from our speakers is, 
First of all, what does the right to food actually mean to people who are experiencing poverty? And also for academics engaging with um, experts by experience, it's, we should be really mindful around some of the issues around the language or terminology that we use and um, that people with lived experience might not actually identify with or relate to. I think as well it's important to really listen to how those with lived experience of food poverty want to be involved um, and also being flexible and taking steps to, to make sure that we address any sort of barriers to participation. So, you know, exam for example, ensuring that um, accessible venues are used, that events are scheduled at appropriate times of the day, um, making sure that we pay travel expenses, subsistence expenses, um, and also offering childcare where appropriate. So really being aware of those potential barriers to participation. I think lastly for me, I'm really interested in hearing from the speakers about how they navigate the often significant time cost that comes with being involved um, in this sort of work and also how that can also be balanced alongside the more empowering and transformative aspect of actually being involved in advocating for change. Next slide please Emily. All right, so I'm going to stop talking now so we can hear from the experts by experience in the US, the UK and Canada and also from those working with them. So firstly, from the US, we have Sharita Muzan, who's an expert by experience and leadership coach for the Building Wealth and Health Network, and Mariana Chilton, Witnesses to Hunger co-founder. And second, we'll hear from Heather Walters, expert by experience, and Ben Pearson from Food Power from the UK. And finally, from Canada, we'll hear from Julie Alatiet, expert by experience, and Catherine Scarf from Community Food Centres Canada. And once we've heard from all the speakers, we'll have time for some questions and then some final closing thoughts from our speakers. And just to remind everybody, if you have got any questions, please use the chat box and we'll keep an eye on that and use them towards the end of the webinar to form a Q&A discussion. But if you have got any specific um, questions for each pair of speakers, I will try and ask those directly after each presentation. All right, thank you all for listening. So now I want to hand over to Sharita Muzon and Mariana Ch Chilton who will get us started off. Hello, I'm Sharita Mozan, I'm leadership coach for the Building Health and Wealth Network, and also I'm an expert by experience with poverty and hunger. Hi everybody, my name is Mariana Chilton, I'm the founder of Witnesses to Hunger, along with many members of Witnesses to Hunger, and on this slide, I'm, uh, you can find me in the back of the crowd, which is where I like to be. Um, what we're going to, uh, we're talking to you from Philadelphia in the United States, that's on the East Coast in Pennsylvania. And um, Emily, if you go to the next slide, today is the 19th of June, and um, in many places around the country, this is known as Juneteenth. Um, and this is a, an important day to recognize and to remember because um, after slavery was officially ended um, in the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, Many slaves uh, were set free, um, but there were uh, many slaves actually around the country who didn't hear about the news and white people who kept slaves anyway. And it wasn't until on June 19th in 1865 that the last group of slaves were set free. And um, I think it's, an, it's really important to acknowledge this day in our own history and also to recognize um, the resilience and the power of the black community, African-American community, and also to remember that um, the U.S. government uh, has never really been uh, supportive of the rights of its own people. And uh, even though they tout human rights around the world, I have to say that um, the U.S. government has a pretty bad history and that a lot of white people actually continue that that type of history and as you all understand that um, our current president is continuing unfortunately in that legacy. So here's to Juneteenth and um, to our resistance and our resilience. Next slide please. And if you could just scroll all the way through I'll tell you a little bit about Witnesses to Hunger. Sharita will talk about how she has moved on um, beyond Witnesses to really focus on promoting resilience and then she and I will do a little question and answer. So next slide. So witnesses to hunger. Oh, before we got before we get started, I think it's important to talk about the disparities and the inequalities in food insecurity in the United States. Female-headed households have the highest rates of food insecurity and hunger. 
Um, and also by race and ethnicity, even though there are far more white people by numbers in terms of those who experience food insecurity, um, in terms of the burden on the population, Latino families or Hispanic families, as some people might know them, and black families have much higher rates. And if you scroll to the next slide, please, Emily, um, I think it's important to recognize that the um, severity of these inequalities has been continuing over the years. The blue and the green lines show the black uh, households and the Latino households have rates that are two to three times that of white households. And um, the U.S. government often does not recognize uh, or address these inequalities or these disparities. And of course, these are rooted in the history, in U.S. history, in the way that uh, whites have treated African Americans and immigrants and Native Americans. And we can see how these disparities are basically a continuation of our own history. All the more reason to focus on human rights and um, the empowerment of women. And this is why Witnesses to Hunger, you can go to the next slide, Emily, is, uh, start, is uh, a program that we started 10 year, over 10 years ago. And it's making sure that people who have experienced food insecurity and hunger and who have been trying to break out of poverty are in the lead um, of the dialogue in the United States about how to address hunger and poverty. So these are some of the members of Witnesses to Hunger. We're in um, many sites, especially on the East Coast of the United States, Boston, New Haven, Washington, DC. And this was us uh, a few years ago at, uh, headed to the women's conference that was headed by the previous White House administration. Next slide. Um, one of the ways that we utilize, that we have a chance to speak up about the issues that are affecting people the most is, is really through an intimate type of a process is through the camera. And that's Imani Sullivan. She's showing you the Canon power shot that each of the members of Witnesses got in 2008. Uh, Sharita got her camera in 2010. Um, and the idea behind the camera is that it becomes sort of, a, it becomes your friend, becomes your voice. And we have created exhibits that have been shown all across the country. They've shown in other places as well. Um, and the idea is that it's the, the people who are, who are framing the issues are those with a lived experience. And what better way to do that that transcends words um, and also space and time through images and photographs. Next slide, please. And this is Imani Sullivan. Uh, she's, the, she's talking about a photograph that she took of her son. Uh, and she's talking directly to Senator Casey. As soon as the slide comes, you'll see um, what, how Witnesses to Hunger works. That's Imani. She has taken a photograph of her son. We are at the United States Senate there. And we're talking to one of our senators. It's an important representative in the United States. That's Senator Bob Casey. And the idea is to get people like me out of the picture and to make sure that those who know the experience of hunger and poverty firsthand are speaking directly to the people who have the power and using the photograph as a launching pad. Um, next slide, please. Um, and you can, yeah. So Witnesses was, was founded with the human rights principles, with the idea of participation of those who have had their rights violated to make sure that they can actually lead the conversation uh, it's a really important uh, framework for the human rights framework to, uh, to be highly participatory and to address issues of racism and discrimination and gender discrimination. I have to say, though, that the human rights language is not uh, particularly resonant in the United States. And many people that I've spoken with who have experienced deep poverty don't trust the language of human rights. Um, and maybe we could talk about in the question and answer. Back to witnesses, some of the strategies that we have are, first of all, a sense of love and commitment and care for each other. That is primary. And you can't, if you don't have love for each other, you can't really do the work. Um, the method, methods of our engagement are through our exhibits and images, um, speaking engagements. We've provided formal testimonies at um, the United States Congress multiple times um, and at the state level, the city level. Lots of in-person meetings with members of Congress. Uh, we do staff briefings, which helps to educate legislative staff. We talk to the press a lot. Uh, we do some local actions. We have a website, and sometimes we blog, and we're on Twitter and on Facebook. And I'm sorry, I forgot to put our handles there, but if you Google us, <laughs> you'll find us. OK, now I'm going to turn it over to Sharita. If you go to the next slide, please. So Sharita, it's all yours. 
Well, hello everyone. As someone with lived experience and private hunger, it is a trauma that is not talked about, especially in the black community. Um, you feel isolated and you feel ashamed and you feel embarrassed. And I am someone who is living proof of that. I'm going to school, being hungry. Um, not having the one to really talk to about it, living in a cold house, um, no heat, um, no gas, no water, and learning how to survive. Um, and also carrying that pain and not having, really not having an outlet to talk about it. Cause like I said, it's not something that you talk about to people. Um, and, and like I said, and, and, and plus you're embarrassed about your living conditions. So when I found out about the Witness of Hunger program, it provided me a platform to talk about it and to not feel ashamed. Cause so many other people out there are going through the same thing. And it's like you have a sense of like you're not the only one and it's okay to talk about it and to raise awareness. And I think with the Witness of Hunger program, why, why it's important is because it gives you that platform and it starts to break down the stereotypes of what hunger looks like, what living in poverty looks like. Um, people could have a job, you have a two a two income household, and still it's hard to put food on the table. And I think that people, you know, think that uh, people in poverty maybe are on drugs or, or maybe you know um, whatever for, for like for like, whatever reason. But people out here are going through poverty and hunger who do have jobs, you know. Um, and who are highly educated, you know, but it's still hard sometimes to make ends meet. And I wanted to raise awareness about poverty and hunger and not be ashamed so that other people out here like me could talk about it and feel safe and not worry about the backlash. And I think with talking about it, there there is a lot of backlash sometimes, you know, uh, people make racist comments um, and you get, uh, you feel isolated from your own community because you're talking about it. Whereas it, we, we, we were told to keep it quiet, like keep it in your house, don't talk about it. And I think that with more people advocating and like talking about it and sharing our stories, people don't have to feel like they're alone or, or feel like they're pressured to be quiet. Like it's okay to talk about it. And talk about it is to heal. And being so I'm a trauma survivor myself, it's good to talk about it in poverty and hunger so I could appreciate what I have now and teach other people it's okay to be hungry. It's okay to share your story because somebody out there went through worse times than you are, you know? And when they hear our stories, they be like, oh, well, she, she can talk about it, then I can do it too. And in a sense, it's empowering each other and building up a, a community. Um, and Talking about it, raising awareness, and like the webinar is so awesome. Um, it's amazing, and for people to look at this and learn from our stories, to ask questions, um, to raise awareness, I think is key. And that's why I love doing the work that I do to pro to promote resilience. And it's, and don't be ashamed. It's not where you came from. It's where you're going. The past does not define you. You are in charge of your future. You are in charge of your destiny. And just appreciate the good, you know, to appreciate the good stuff. Um, and even me for my trauma with being hungry and food insecure, I over shop now because I'm afraid to be without. Um, I know what that's like to be without. I just can't like just buy one thing. I have to buy multiple items. And that is my trauma from being food insecure. So I just hope that with this, you know, we're just be champions in this fight against hunger. America has a lot of wealth, a lot of food. People should not be hungry 2019. I just can't fathom that anymore. People should not be hungry at all. Next slide. That's, <laughs> that's, 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 we're, we're almost finished. And if you just go to the next slide and Shri, you just want to say a little bit about the importance of mentoring others. And then, cause we're, we're at our time. Cause okay. I think you say, get, get the last word. So, <laughs> I just am um, a champion in my resilience. And I just wanted to just, like I said, just bring more awareness around trauma, around food insecurity. The people don't have to be ashamed. Let's talk about it and keep the conversation going. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll go on mute now. Brilliant. Thank you for that, um, Sharita and Mariana. Um, so 
next, I thought, oh, I thought we had um, Heather and Ben next, but that's fine. Have we got Julie and Catherine? Is, are, are Julie and Catherine next? I am here, Kaylee. I managed to get it working. All right. Okay. Brilliant. So I think, Emily, we've got um, Heather and Ben up now. Um, Heather Walter is expert by experience in food power um, and Ben Pearson from Food Power. I'll hand over to you too. Are you both here? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Brilliant. Slide. If you could have the first slide, Kelly, thank you. Yeah, if you can have the first slide up, Emily, please. Brilliant, thank you. Over to you too. So okay. I'm um, Heather Walters, an expert by experience with uh, Food Power Newcastle, um, and I'll hand over to Ben for the introduction. Hi, and I'm Ben Pearson. I work on the Food Power Program with Church Action on Poverty, and my role is very much on looking at how people with lived experience of food poverty can be empowered to uh, bring about change. So I'm going to give just a brief introduction on where Food Power came from, what it's about, and then I'm going to hand over to Heather, who will talk through her journey over the last kind of 12 to 18 months, um, whilst working with Food Power Newcastle, which is one of um, over 60 food alliances, which are part of the Food Power programme. And then we'll have a little bit of a conversation about um, what that journey's looked like and where Heather hopes to go to next as well. So if we could have the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, Food Power is a four-year programme. Um, it's funded by the Big Lottery and managed by Church Action on Poverty, who I work for, and Sustain, which is the food and farming charity. Um, it's currently approaching its third year. Um, its aim is to tackle food poverty by what we call a people-powered um, change. Uh, so I think the key element of that is involving those at the grassroots with lived experience in um, bringing about strategic decision making and advocating for change. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so over the last 12 to 18 months, um, I've worked more intensively uh, with around three of the 60 or more food alliances that are currently part of the programme. Um, one of those alliances being Newcastle, where um, Heather joins us uh, from today. Um, I'm also in the north of England in um, Lancashire which is near Manchester. Um, and another one um, of the alliances that I've worked quite closely with is Blackburn with Darwin, which some of the images you'll see throughout the slides um, are um, from today. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, why um, we want to involve um, people with lived experience of food poverty. So I think over the last year, it's become clear um, that there's a number of key principles um, when we think about um, a need to consider when working with those with lived experience. So I just wanted to touch upon um, some of those, some of that learning really that we've um, uncovered over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, and then I think that will lead quite nicely on to um, Heather's sort of overview of how it's um, worked for um, her. Uh, so some of those um, kind of guiding principles and things that we've learned from um, pilot projects that have both worked and haven't worked so well. And I think it's important to understand that um, we've worked with a number of alliances where um, things have been really successful. Um, but there's also alliances that we've worked with where there's been challenges, but we've learned a lot from that. And I think of the next two years of the four year programme, will be taking that learning and looking at how we can build a toolkit and build learning around what really works. So I just wanted to run through what some of those kind of core principles that we've uncovered are. Um, so I think building relationships and trust has been really important. Uh, creating the right space and environment in which uh, people with lived experience feel comfortable in amplifying their voices. Uh, creating a sense of peer support and inclusivity I think has been really important and thinking about really carefully about the group formation. Um, we found as well focusing in on a clear geographic area has worked really well, linking in with the peer support and people having those common experiences to come together and bring about change. 
And I think also uh, looking at building capacity, spreading the load, um, all whilst effectively communicating and negotiating with um, experts constantly, really. Um, I think it's clear um, from conversations just over the last few weeks uh, that we need to do even more to move away from the them and us and start turning some of those stories of um, people living and experiencing uh, poverty, food insecurity, hunger, turning those stories um, into actions. So if we can move on to the next um, slide and I will hand over to Heather to talk about her journey so far up in Newcastle. Yeah, so um, this this all originally started for, for me and my mum because um, as I left college it was just me and her living in the house. So I went straight on to job seekers allowance it was the the benefit at the time that I could get um, and so mum was working a part-time job I was getting job seekers allowance it wasn't enough to feed us and house us and everything um, so fast forwarding um, to a couple of years ago mum started with the community cafe um, and we were in um, a church centre that we used for um kids meals for giving food out um and everything like that that we could we could possibly just kind of just do um and then when it came to the actual getting into the the food power um initiative we were asked to do a survey for um our housing association um that, that owns our houses um we did that and gave them lots of feedback um, and then that then turned into um, us coming and meeting Food Nation and Ben uh, at Church Action on Poverty and then we started um, going all over the place and, and tormenting MPs and um, pestering people in lots of other places we started with the I think I started with the End Hunger UK conference in Westminster in October, um, October last year. And with that, we also ended up on Channel 4 News um, about universal credit and passing that while the, the um, government was still trying to decide on whether they were going to keep rolling it out. Uh, You've just gone quiet, Heather. I'm not sure if your microphone's gone off. There we go. It keeps muting me and unmuting me, and I don't know why. <laughs> Back with us. Um, but yeah, so we 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 did that, and we had an interview on Channel Four, um, and then we went to more conferences, and um, we then started the Food Power Newcastle Facebook group, and uh, that was that that's been going quite well while we've been going on we're kind of using that as a place for everyone to be able to to put their own stuff on um so like from other organizations and other charities around um in the area and then they can it, it's kind of like a promotion for them as well as as us being able to say look if you need to go and for example um there's a another um a charity for hope for homeless that that do a community meal on a monday night if anybody needed to to go there and say right well we already know about this one go on up and, and they'll they'll feed you they'll see if there's anything else that they've got at the time because they have like clothing and, and shampoos and things like that um and that i feel is is it's getting there but it we need to, to develop a bit more on that one um and then it's it's kind of just been a lot <laughs> uh, we've been going through everything as as much as we can um we've been down to the house of lords um in our parliament um sat with a couple of politicians and just, just, just she was asking some very strange questions when we were there um and i think the the reason that i like it is because i will quite happily just go there and tell them how it is I'm completely blunt with them. I don't pander around it. And if they ask stupid questions, then I will give them the answer very bluntly, um, which happened quite a lot in that meeting in the House of Lords. So um, we we just kind of keep going with, with what we're doing um, and we're hoping to just to keep going. 
and try and make it a lot better for everyone. Thanks, Heather. I did have a couple of questions, which I know we have discussed that I thought we could have a little mm -hmm. conversation about. So you've talked um, about your experiences and how you got involved. And um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about how your own experiences kind of motivated you to take action. Well, I mean, I'd just come out of college. I had absolutely no experience on anything. I couldn't get a job. Um, I've got disabilities that were playing up at the time as well, so that there was no use to anyone really. Um, but when I was on the job seekers, they basically had me down as sharing with someone. I know at the, originally I was living with my mum, but it, eventually I moved out and I was on my own and I was still classed as sharing with someone. So when I was living on my own, I had, I think it was about £52 a week to live on. And that was bills, food, anything, um, heating, gas, everything on £52 a week at 20 year old. Um, and it was, it was hard. It was a real struggle. Um, I did, there were times where it would be the case of it was one thing or another. I couldn't have both. Um, we had to, or I had to try and sort it out where I would be able to afford meals for the full week or the full fortnight because we got paid fortnightly. Um, and there would be days where I wouldn't get three square meals a day. There would be days where I'd be lucky if I just had my breakfast. Um, I would try everything to try and make everything cheaper. Um, I would go on uh, reduce shopping to try and get fresh meat, fresh veg, um, and it would get down to like five pence each item. Um, and that was like a it was like a picnic when I was going there because it was it was brilliant. Um, but that shouldn't be the way that you would have to do it. It's, I like to be, I liken it to being the, the one that can stand up for those who can't say anything anymore um, or don't feel that they've got the right or the, the knowledge, the power, the, anything to be able to, to stand up for, for themselves and to stand up for other people and kind of tell the truth about it, to, to sit there and be like, well, no, the, the statistics are wrong. Um, because this is happening a lot more than everybody else thinks and that everybody else will talk about. So I am there to talk about it and to get it out there and try and get it less stigmatised. Yeah, thanks for that, Heather. That came across really well. And just one sort of last question. So um, obviously you're part of Food Power Newcastle and there's a number of experts by experience, activists across the programme. How has coming together and being part of both Food Power Newcastle and the wider programme sort of brought about change, do you think? And what are your sorts of dreams and visions for the future, both for your work within Food Power, but also as an activist in your own right? Well, I would like to continue going the way I'm going. I think it's going brilliantly. Um, I mean, we're we're working with all of the other the charities that we uh, and organisations still that we started with. Um, so it would be like IFAN and um, you guys at Church Action on Poverty, um, Food Nation, End Hunger, UK um, campaigns and all that. And I really want to keep going with that because I, the, I still feel like it, it, hasn't, it hasn't gone as far as I can take it. And I want to keep going because I want it to be a case of it, it is 2019, it's getting closer and closer to 2020 and it shouldn't be like that now. It, we shouldn't be in the way that we're going. And I want to make the government stand up and I want to make people realise that this is the way that it's going and it's not actually changing at all. Um, so we're, we need to kind of, I feel that we need to, to keep going and, um, and make everything uh, and make people stand up and be accountable for what's going on. Um, and to basically just get the, the shut up and listen and then do something about it. Thanks Heather for that, um, brilliant. Could we just, um, is there anything else you want to add? Um, not at this moment in time, not that I can think of anyway. <laughs> if we can just move on to the next slide please. 
to slide to go. Yeah, lovely. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to um, end that on a quote, which um, I think sums up part of the problem we're dealing with, but also the opportunity that we have, one which can kind of um, inspire and emphasize the need to empower and involve those with lived experience to bring about change. And just last week, it was um, our Food Power Conference up in Newcastle, which had a help to speak and co-facilitate at. And uh, just a quote, which I just thought of then, which I hadn't included um, in the um, PowerPoint, but uh, Kath, uh, one of um, Heather's colleagues up there, also someone with uh, lived experience, talked about how there needs to be a little less conversation and a little more action. And I think for me, that's something that probably Heather will agree with and what we're trying to move forward with over the uh, next two years of the Food Power Programme. Um, I think that's all from us. Um, I think there's one more slide with our contact details on if anybody wants to take those, but thank you. All right, brilliant. Thanks for that, Heather and Ben. Um, we haven't had like any specific questions for each of uh, the sets of speakers so far. So what I'll do is I'll just get the questions at the end, and then there might be, you know, key themes that you can all speak to. So at the minute, no more, um, no questions. Um, all right. So next then, our final speakers. We've got Julie Alatiat and we've got Catherine Scarf. Um, and um, Julie is expert by experience and Catherine is from Community Food Centres Canada. So over to you too. Thanks. Uh, I'm just waiting for Catherine. Uh, I don't see her camera quite yet. <clears throat> um, I guess I can go ahead and introduce myself. So my name's Julie Alatiat. I'm talking to you from Calgary, Alberta. Um, and just in, I'm, I guess, the ex there's Catherine. Hi. Um, Go ahead, continue. OK. <laughs> um, so I guess I'm the expert by lived experience. Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment, um, because we're coming from Canada, and I am part of a colonized uh, group myself um, and the spirit of reconciliation. I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm talking to you from traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kainai, Pikani, the Susina, Stony Nakoda Nations and Métis Nation Region 3, and all of the people we make our homes in uh, Treaty 7. Um, so I guess I'll pass it over to Catherine. Um, I wasn't quite sure how we were going to start. Yeah, I'm going to give a little overview of uh, and context of Community Food Centres Canada and how you and I kind of are connected and know each other and then we'll go into the interview piece of it where we have we've worked on a couple of questions beforehand to kind of elicit what what's go what has gone on with you and your experience at the Alex Community Food Centre. So as Julie um, points out, we're we're pretty far apart actually, um, and we've never met in person. So there's kind of a, an organization between us called the Alex Community Food Center, um, and which has grown out of the work of my organization at a national level, which was founded in uh, 2012, uh, to to uh, to kind of take the model that a number of us had worked on in West Toronto and spread it nationally. So part of our work is raising resources and, um, pass and partnering with organizations across the country to build community food centers, um, like the Alex Community Food Center in Calgary. Um, and part of our work is to, so we have 11 of those now, we aim for 20 by 2022. Um, as well, we work in a kind of a lighter touch way with a broader network of organizations uh, across the country, about 150 uh, good food organizations, as they're called, as we call them, and they call themselves, work together around um, certain shared principles. And then finally, we work on uh, policy and systemic issues around poverty and health. So we kind of try and take a grassroots up uh, approach, as well as um, you know more of a government relations and and policy activism approach. So that because we know we can't solve the problem from the ground up. Um, could I get the next slide? Thanks. So um, I did want to focus, though, to, to contextualize uh, 
again, Julie and I, uh, on the Community Food Center part of the work because that's how she starts out her story with this work starts. So a Community Food Center, uh, to give you a sense, is a place where people come together to cook, grow, share, and advocate for good food. Um, they aim to increase access to food, food skills, and, conf and confidence around food uh, and nutrition, reducing, reduce social isolation, increase knowledge of poverty and food systems issues, and create opportunities for action on those issues. So a community food center is uh, a dignified and welcoming space, often with a kitchen, garden, dining room. Uh, it's adaptive. The program specific programs are adapted to the specific community, uh, but it is uh, important that it has an actual staff. It's not just run by volunteers. A lot of our, our food bank sector is very, very marginal and very under-resourced. So the idea is that there is kind of minimum standard of staffing to support it and infrastructure. And we focus on a kind of reciprocal relationship with the world where we, we uh, um, expect and ask for the necessary resources to run the, these centers and do the work that we do because we think it's important, but we, we sort of reciprocally commit to do a good job, focus on actual making an impact and being transparent and accountable uh, to the world about that impact. Uh, next slide. Could I have a next slide? So there's uh, each each community food center has three key areas of work. Um, the food access piece, which is still important, as we know, um, we try and do it and uh, ensure that it's done in a, uh, a dignified and community building way. So often it's community meals. A few of our centers have food banks. Uh, many of them don't. Uh, we work on markets, and I believe Julie has experience doing that, and community gardens. And then as well, we do a lot of uh, community cooking and, and gardens and after-school programs with kids. And, uh, and then importantly, every center has a function and a kind of mandate to do some of this work that brings us here today around community action, uh, organizing in social justice clubs, but also in peer groups uh, where people uh, bring their lived experience to um, other people in the community in terms of helping them navigate entitlements um, and also work on um, issues, sometimes local issues, and we are trying to create opportunities for um, centers and people at the grassroots to connect with national issues around income security and that sort of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're just, the rest of the slides are just uh, pictures from the Alex Community Food Center. So you, there's about five or six, you just get a sense of, uh, of what it looks like and what the programs are like. And if you're, uh, if you have a sharp eye and one of them, you'll be able to pick out Julie, but I'd like to start with Julie now. Hi again. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you and your partner, your story um, start with the Alex and, and with Food Bank starts when you and your partner both ended up out of work at the same time and in pretty bad financial straits. Uh, what would you say were the systems that failed you to get you to that point where you hit the wall? Um, so uh, to a little more context, so at the time that this happened, I had just given birth. You can see my son. Uh, he's, I think, seven months. He's just trying food now. Um, so he, I had just gone on maternity leave and in Canada, you get a year or you can extend it to 18 months. And I had taken the one year option. So you don't receive any of your salary, you go basically on employment insurance. Uh, so that's what I had access to at the time. Uh, my partner had been laid off and then due to some kind of glitch in the paperwork was uh, his employment insurance was also denied and then also delayed. So um, there was a lack of, uh, from a systems view, we didn't have access uh, to a lot of resources and assistance because on paper it had looked like we were previously employed and that we were um, assessed on our previous year's taxes. So we went from like two working individuals who had a salary and a stable income to zero money coming in, but we couldn't um, access any of those particular assistance programs because we couldn't prove like at the time because it just so had happened. So we found ourselves with um, a very limited income. So to give you an idea of what employment insurance or it's called EI, um, you receive 80% if you are on maternity leave of your current salary, so which is about $800 a month. So our expenses all told were probably about $2,000. That didn't include food. 
So I had just given birth to my son and I have another son who at the time was about two or three. Uh, so we, um, we had no medical benefits at the time. So that means we could show up at emergency, but if we needed anything to do with dental or we needed to buy um, medicine, we had to um, pay for that out of pocket. Um, so it would have certainly reduced the amount of stress if I was able to access some other resources at the time. Great. Are you, shall I move on? What's that? I, I just wondering if you finished that part, that question, yes. sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, so Julie has done a lot of media um, and you'll get some links to that at the, uh, at the end. And I've watched uh, her and heard her story. Um, and one of the stories I, I heard you tell that was quite moving um, was the time that you and your kids had to walk away from your grocery cart at the checkout because you realized that you had no money in your bank account um, when you mm. tried to use your banking cart. Um, so naturally enough, when you hit a point like that and you want to eat and you want your kids to eat, you start looking at the food bank option. Um, I think a lot of people who haven't used a food bank um, in the world tend to think of it like a grocery store for poor people. At the end, you run out of money, you go there and you get some more groceries and it's great. Um, you know, I happen to know from hearing your story that that was not the case. Um, can you describe what the difference is in terms of the right to, you know, the question of the right to food and the difference between having the right to food and not? You know, how is, how is being able to buy and choose your own groceries different from the experience of going to the food bank? It was very different. As you can see on the picture, this is one of the pictures of the uh, produce market that we started at the Alex, and those are two of my friends standing behind there. You can see that the baskets are laid out, so you have a choice of which fruits and vegetables you would like to have, and there was no requirement to produce any ID. If you go to a food bank in Alberta, in Calgary, you first need to make a phone call. You have to be assessed over the phone, so you have to produce all kinds of information, which I, at the time, was quite upset about because they asked me for my health ID number. There's no medical service provided when you go to the food bank. And I didn't understand why they needed my medical ID number. And so in order for you to access the food, you not only have to be assessed by the phone, you have to make an appointment. So there's all that rigmarole and you have to be on the phone with them the entire time or otherwise you have to start at the beginning. Um, and once you get to the food bank, you stand in line. There's no chatter, there's it's not a friendly space. Nobody's gonna be like, hi, how are you? You get in line, you produce your ID, and you kind of get put through, um, it's very transactional, you get put through like a, um, a lineup. So um, people ask you questions and they're yes or no, um, and they hand you the food. And some of the food is not actually nutritious. It's like some candy, um, because you know, it's up to what people donate. Sometimes people in this particular area feel that um, people who are food insecure want candy when really you just want something else like fruits and vegetables maybe some meat dairy so uh, when you go through the food bank you get handed all these packages and some of them you don't know what's inside it's a yes or no and that's it you don't have any chance to contemplate it you get put into a cart and you get shuffled along they really want you to hustle you're not really supposed to hang out and talk to anyone or st stay in line um, so this is a little problematic for me because I had a really small baby in a car seat so I could only I, I didn't, I could push the stroller and then the cart and then I actually had my partner come because uh, at the end they want you to get out. So um, if you have a baby seat and there was two other moms that were there too, so I watched their babies while they ran their cart to the car, wherever they were going. The other thing is the food bank is located in an area that is not necessarily easily accessible by transit. You don't know that when you're going there you're going to have these boxes of food. Uh, because you're not allowed to access the food bank on a regular basis. Well, you can on a regular basis, but not every day. You can only go something like six times a year. So you have to space it out. You're not allowed to go every week, for example. So it was very transactional um, and a lot of hustle. So I didn't know what I got until I had gotten home. Yeah. Well, that's certainly, yeah, the, the contingency of every aspect of that experience is so different than the idea of having, uh, you know, the unquestioned right to, to food and the idea that you just don't know what you're getting, you don't know when you're getting it, you don't know how you're getting it, how much, what you're going to be eating. It's, it's just unthinkable if you haven't had to go through it. Um, you talked a little bit before about some of the attitudes and assumptions that you felt were being made about you um, by staff or volunteers at the food banks you visited. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Sure. So the food bank was the last place I wanted to go to because I had heard stories from my friends and I, I really didn't want to go. So I had tried other places. Um, so there's other options you can go to in the, uh, the city I live in. They're called food pantries. And again, you do have to produce ID and you have to wait your turn. So I was calling it the Hunger Games because you could watch people inside, but you couldn't go in yourself. And one of them, I was told I couldn't bring my baby in and I had to find someone to hold him or put him in the car seat and leave him there um, while I went to a different room and access the food. So a lot of those folks were really shocked at me because I said no to a lot of the food, mostly because it wasn't nutritious. Oops, sorry. And um, well, I didn't feel like my kids were going to, I wasn't going to eat it and my kid wasn't going to eat it. So things like highly processed food, there was a lot of sodium in it. They had very little nutritious content and they were really surprised that I turned it down. And I walked away a couple times with one or two items in my hand because that's all I, I could, that's all I could handle like trying to get my son to eat, um, who was two or three at the time. And we had spent a lot of time and energy focusing our food um, consumption on um, vegetables and fruit. Um, and, and none of that was available at any of those places. It was highly processed, mostly in cans. Um, and one lady even said, like, I can't believe you're not going to take um, this sugary cereal. Your kid will love it. And I was like, uh, we've never had that before. I don't even. And there's so I turned it down. Uh, and she was really surprised. Um, I'm going to just skip a little ahead uh, so that we don't run out of time. Um, so sort of fast forward to uh, the Alex Community Food Center and, and um, how you came to be there and, and what was different about it. And then we'll just collapse that with the next question and say, like, for anybody who's listening who works at an agency, uh, you know, like, that, that offers food aid or, or any of these types of services, what would you pass on from, from your experience with the Alex about how to operate programs that, that acknowledge people's full experience, their assets and their inherent worth? Um, I don't know if you saw the picture at the beginning, but the uh, way the Alex is set up is all those tables are flat. There's no physical space when you sit down to eat where somebody is physically higher than, than you. Um, so uh, that's one of the biggest things. Um, um, I would say, so the reason I got to the Alex is nobody asked me for any idea, any ID. I didn't have to produce any information that um, was like a financial assessment. All I, could, all I had to say was I was interested in the program. I had two kids, they had childcare for me um, and there was no questions, further questions asked. I never had to justify any of my story. I never had to explain anything. And when I got there, people were just really interested in saying hello and how are you? And they made space for me at those tables. Um, and we sat together when we ate our food together in the, our class, we prepared it together and we cleaned it up together. So there was a lot of investment in community and getting the conversation going. So I would say for um, for folks who are creating those kinds of programs that I would I would make space at the table. I think that once I was at the table and I was able to articulate what I, what I was strong at and what my skills were, um, the folks at the Alex were really good at drawing out my strengths and giving me space to percolate ideas and resources to make them happen. So you saw a picture of the resort or the um, fresh food market. That was one of the first kinds of markets in Calgary where people were not required to show ID. They simply had to say how many people they were feeding in their household and they were able to access fresh fruit and vegetables. And that was once a week. And that program has continued on and has now spanned to a few other kinds of organizations. I would also say that when you have meals together, this was the first time for me where we all sat at the table. The people who made the food, we were served like we were in a restaurant with dignity. So I wasn't required to line up. I got to sit down and eat my food. My kid got to join me um, and um, we got to have a conversation. So not only was there a, a food, but we got to have connection. There was a lot of kindness that was extended to me. Um, and Although I still don't have like a ton of money, um, I still have time and energy to give. And so um, when that kind of gift, it's, it's huge. 
because that's not what you get in the lineup when you go to the food bank or when you ask access any other resources. Um, there's a lot of stigma attached to it. I'm sure that um, the other speakers can attest to this, but there's a lot of shame and not being able to produce or find enough food for you, especially if you have children or you have people that are dependent on you. Um, and it creates a lot of trauma and a lot of anxiety and depression because you just kind of swirl into you think, oh, I deserve this, so this is where I'm here. So um, I would say that if you can create a, create a space where people can have a conversation, a lot of people are not looking for a handout. They want to hand up. They want to hand up so that they can build their own lives and they can take control of what they would like to do with their, with their own space and what they have available. So I would suggest that. Great, thanks. Um, could you just go back one slide for a second? So uh, community food centers, you know, try to, they have sort of a program mix that tries to meet people at different moments and different needs in their lives. So uh, the other low barrier access, come in, have a meal, hang out, that may be all you ever do, but then you may be like Julie and, and get involved in, um, in volunteering at the center. So we try and have like the volunteers who are at the center be people who are using the services rather than that kind of unequal dynamic that often happens in charities. Um, and then also, I don't think, Julie, you're directly involved in the community action program, but this picture here is from, because it was very um, specifically youth focused in Calgary. So the, yes. the picture in the bottom left is the youth community action group that organized a mayoral debate. You can actually see the mayor of Calgary, the furthest along on the right slide. Um, and then I guess just a picture from the event there. But that's kind of an example of the work that is done to, you know, to help people find their voice and, and to um, take action. I just wanted to come back though to you uh, again, Julie, just to wrap up and say, uh, tell me, um, what do you, what are your, your thoughts on policy change and what it would really look like to make uh, food more of a human right? What would you like to see? Um, I'd certainly like to see less um, like you described the CFC model around having low barriers to access. The other thing is in this question, in this picture, sorry, where you see the youth action group they're they're amazing. Um, uh, that it, the, also that the organization taps into other, um, areas in the community. Um, and that the organization is not just like handing stuff out. I think what really stood out about the CFC model, the Canada Food Center model, is that it's all about building capacity. Um, so you get skills. So it's not just like food. So um, it's about like developing your strengths, your interests, and being able to dream a little bit. Like what happened to us being able to have a dream? <laughs> like just because we're food insecure once in a while doesn't mean we don't have ideas about how our community can be and what we'd like to do and what we'd like to see. So this picture is amazing um, because the kids who were, I say kids because I'm kind of old. So those kids are, they're in like, the, you know, um, high school, maybe early 20s. Um, and they developed and designed this whole um, idea where they asked the mayoral candidates to come and have a, a dinner with them and sit down at the table and ask them questions about what they'd like their city to see, to be like and what they'd like their future to be. So um, I'd say that if policies can integrate some way that you know we're not just like human beings that need to be fed, but we're also people who um, would like to be involved in our community and we'd like to build something different. Great, thanks. Yeah, so just to wrap up, uh, if you could just go to the last slide, there's a couple of links there where you can see more about the Alex or about community food centers. And just in terms of what we're working on at the policy level, um, we're working at the grassroots to have uh, across all of our centers to run an advocacy food camp and kind of relating it to our upcoming election in the fall, um, equipping people to both tell their stories, but also to um, be involved in things like fall candidates debates locally and to help the organize them and how to you know meet with your MP and that kind of thing um, and then we're also working on um, trying to get an to get uh, the parties to commit to um, changing how tax credits work so that um, people can access more income uh, through our tax system it just it's, it's what we have at the federal level that we can interact with so thank you so much everybody for listening to us and um, thank you Julie for your interesting and inspiring story and work.
Yeah, so thanks to you both um, for that. That's brilliant. Thanks to all the speakers. So now we've got about 20 minutes or so for some questions. Um, I'll start off. There is one specifically um, for Mariana. Then I've got a few more that I can sort of, I guess, ask to the whole um, group. Do we want to all put our um, webcams back on as well, just so everyone can see? It? Yeah, the all the speakers. Brilliant. Thank you. All right. So. Yeah, so the, the question that I had specifically for Mariana was, you mentioned before that there was some sort of pushback um, in terms of like from anti-hunger around using this sort of human rights framework. You know, you mentioned that there was a sort of lack of trust around that. So um, there was a question asking if you could just elaborate on that a little bit more or sh share any resources with us on that. Sorry, I can't hear you, Mariana. <laughs> Are you unmuted? Sorry. Brilliant. Okay. Sorry. Right. You're back. Um, I do have a, a publication with some of the other members of Witnesses to Hunger on uh, photo voice and participatory action and human rights. And you can find that online if you Google it. Um, the thing is that legislators in the United States, when you start saying human rights, they just completely turn off. And I've seen it happen as I've been testifying um, in front of Congress where people will literally say, I, we don't believe that, that, that food is a basic human right and that freedom from want is not something that's enshrined in, the, um, in our constitution and uh, which becomes a, a bit of a turnoff <laughs> to try to get people to, to really listen. So even though the Witnesses to Hunger was founded with a human rights framework and we have actually tried on a number of different times to do human rights education it doesn't really even resonate, especially with um, women of color that we've worked with. And I, I don't think, Sharita, you and I have really talked about human rights mm -hmm. as an issue. Um, and that's because in my other work, when I was originally, originally getting started on, on human rights and the right to food, most of the women I talked to um, considered the whole concept of human rights as a joke because um, it was sort of as if it was created by white people who were very privileged, who are not living the lives that, that we're living. Um, so for instance, uh, one woman said, you know, I was raped, no one ever helped to get me uh, the help that I needed in terms of mental health and there was no justice there. My daughter was raped, the police wouldn't help me there. Um, almost every day we see acts of police brutality in the United States. So the idea that, that we should be fighting for human rights is just like, it's too distal and it's um, it's it's um, in some sense from the from the women's perspectives, it's it's not close enough to the heart and not close enough to the lived uh, to the lived experience. And so that language doesn't really that has doesn't really resonate. But Sharita, do you want to say something about human rights and the right to food or anything like that? I think everyone should have a right to food. I mean, there's no question. Of, there's no question about that. It's just. Um, incomprehensible that people don't have a, a right to healthy food. I don't understand it at all. And, and any of the yeah, other speakers, have you got anything else to say on, on that, on what Mariana and Sharita were saying? Any other thoughts on how the sort of right to food resonates with you guys? I actually do, um, because we really debated whether or not to use uh, the right to food as a kind of a rallying cry. And while I think it does have resonance, uh, in the way that you just said, that as of course everybody should have a right to food. When you speak of it colloquially that way, people get it, I think. But when you talk about it in an international rights framework, it becomes very abstract and very, very distant. And it feels like you could fight for a hundred years just to get your government to recognize their, their international commitments, let alone taking the next steps to actually make it happen. So we actually decided that we wouldn't use it as our a kind of a the framework for our for our activist work um but again that doesn't mean we don't think food is a human right and we do but um and we speak of it that way but we're just not so interested in our government's particularly interested in the sustainable development goals at the moment which is sort of an international framework but it's not so much connected to the, the covenant on the, the social declaration or whatever it is so you guys know that better than i do but um, anyway, I'll stop there. Well, thanks for that, Catherine. Um, any, anybody else, Ben? I was just going to say, I think 
Um, obviously, everybody should have a right to food. I think there is um, something around the language and terminology that we use, especially when working with people with the about how how people want to talk about the right to food. I don't know if Heather wants to say something more about that, but sometimes I think things can be um, termed in quite academic or ways in which the, myself who works uh, within um, within the sector um, sometimes people to understand. So I think it's obvious that everybody has a right to food. I think it's how we find ways that we can talk about that in a more sensible way. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think um, when it comes to people talking about the right to food, I think it, it, to a lot of people who are in the experience themselves, I think they don't quite understand where, where people are coming from. But if you say to somebody, you know, you, if you have a, like you have a right to food, you have a right to um, be able to, to physically speak to, you know, people and, and go to get the food that you, you need to have. Um, you know, if you if you live if you live like I think it's like three weeks without food, you'll die. You know, it's just it's three days without water and three weeks without food or something around those lines. And you say that to somebody who's going through, it and they're like, actually, yeah, I get that. And I think when it comes to the academia, especially Katie, when we were at the um, at the conference in Birmingham where I'm sat there and I'm like I have no idea what's going on here because I am not academic at all um, I'm just sat I'm like that's a big word yep mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah it, it does come down to a lot of, uh, of language that people are using so I think it, sometimes, sometimes that does need to be looked at especially when you're talking to the people with the lived experience yeah, thanks for that, Heather. I def definitely agree, and I think it's that's definitely a tension that I can see, like in my own work, and trying to do events such as that, where you know you are inviting academics, some of whom do talk in more like theoretical ways. Like I don't, because I don't really understand that myself either. But I think there is that sort of that barrier sometimes for people. Um, but I think there was one question I wanted to ask as well that sort of came up. I think in probably all of your presentations. Um, but definitely around, Ben, you were mentioning this, around how we can move away from this sort of them and us um, sort of thing and how we can actually turn stories into sort of action and, and change. So, and Heather, you mentioned there about sort of, you know, a little less conversation, more action. I just wondered if you wanted to sort of say a little bit more about how we can actually do that. So, you know, instead of just talking, how can we move to action? you want to start, Heather, or myself? It's up to you. Well, um, I mean, for us, I think the, the main thing with, our, with us as experts by experience, me and one of the other ladies, Kath, were, were talking about this at the conference um, when we, we were on about the little less conversation, a little more action. And Kath herself, she's starting to get a little bit bored with all the conferences. Um, she would rather go and do a march down to Parliament and go and, you know, picket lines and, and banners and shouting and screaming and, you know, doing a lot of like kind of arty projects and things like that. Um, and that's kind of the, the way she wants to take things, um, which totally fine with, you know, if she wants to go and do that, she can go do that. I'm not going to be marching down anywhere anytime soon. Um, but. Um, I am happy to to go and speak to like the like the politicians to the the people who need to hear it. Um, whereas I I feel like that is my action. I'm going there and I'm telling them how it is and I'm telling them what it's like. Um, but yeah, sometimes a little more um, action in the way of physically being able to see somebody doing something like in protests or um or something like that would be would be advantageous as well because it will not only show us doing something but it'll also then show like the media coverage on it would be um showing everybody else that we're doing something about it as well and i think on that as well in in regards to moving um those individual stories where people will talk about their experiences of 
um, hunger or poverty, it's how many times do individuals want to tell those stories? Um, and many of the experts like Heather and the young people who the photos were of in Darwin earlier where they've now set up their own Gets Hungry campaign. And um, I think it's about, certainly within the Food Power programme, we don't want two more years of the same people telling the story to Channel 4 time and time again because what what happens with that? And I think it is uh, when I talk about inclusivity and I think it's looking at how experts by experience that even, I think there's even a problem sometimes with that term, even though our programme terms and experts by experience, when people become empowered and get to a certain point, are we still right to call them that? So, I mean, I tend now to refer to people as activists, campaigners and experts by experience and people can identify in whatever they, where they want with that because there's, uh, I think one of the issues is that there's people who experience food poverty um, who still don't necessarily realise that they're experiencing food poverty or aren't confident in saying, I have lived through this. So I think part of that is about tailoring roles so within Newcastle, within Blackburn and Darwin, there's probably 20 experts by experience there. Not everybody is on Channel 4 talking about how we went hungry, but there's other people within those groups who are uh, doing creative activity, who are marching to the and people are all doing different things. So I think it's really important. Um, and I think just lastly, it's really important to um, include allies within the conversations and not just have a room of people with lived experience that is separate to it should be embedded within all conversations and I mean just um, recently we've uh, just kind of produced a film that's going to be launched over the summer in Blackburn with Darwin which is uh, young people who are involved in producing that with people who were cast, young people who were cast who had no acting experience, who didn't necessarily have experience of, of food poverty, but the conversation started to happen where other people then become activists. And I think it's really important that there's that inclusivity and we don't try to just bring together experts by experience and they're in a room and it's something on the side that we becomes a bit tokenistic. It should be, um, I see Heather and Kath and Corey and the other people that I work with almost as colleagues that they should be within that conversation um, on an ongoing basis and it shouldn't be a tick box that this is a separate group of people. Definitely, thanks Ben. I mean, um, any of the other speakers, do, do you want to sort of come back on that? Or do you, I've got one more question that I think we can fit in um, before we finish, but I just want to give you a chance to sort of come back on that point if you want to. No? All right. Well, I just wanted to pick up actually on something that, um, that Julie, that you and Catherine were talking about just towards the end of your presentation there about policy change and what it would actually look like. So I just wondered if um, Sharita and Heather and if, um, if you wanted to say a little bit about what that would look like in your context, what you think, um, you know, what should policy change, what, what form should it take, what should it look like? I would think that, or I would hope that um, hunger would be like, I don't know, to me, I would say basic common sense for our policymakers <laughs> to ensure that everyone had access to healthy food without making it so complicated and so demeaning for people who, who really need the help. So that's what I would like to see. This, you know, just um, it's having it be of importance to our policymakers. I mean, I think the, the kind of policy things I would like to say is I, the, the same really that it would be it would be seen as a human right. People people need to have food to be able to survive and to be degraded in the way that they are when it comes to having to go to the food banks, having to go and 
and basically put your life on the line and put your life in the hands of somebody else to say actually yeah you, you, you don't earn enough or you don't have enough to be able to afford food so we're going to give you some um, and make them like the and the good guys for being able to give you all this food and you know even if it's not actually that nutritious or if even if it's not actually something that you can eat or something that you can do anything with you might not know how to cook half of the stuff that you get in the food parcels um and you might not be able to to be able to do anything with it to to make it nutritious to make it healthy to make it something that you actually want to eat and that kind of thing needs to i think needs to be addressed as well and it's a lot of our food banks are um are donation based um so yes it's brilliant that so many people are donating to them um and to be able to give people food in the first place but i think education as well on what people in food banks or who are accessing food banks actually need um as well like judy was saying you know people don't want sweets <laughs> you know something nutritious would be nice I think oh, just I'm touching. So sorry, Ben. Carry on. I was just going to say, touching upon that as well, and probably um, <laughs> I've heard voices of uh, a few of the young people that I work with. I think how we frame the conversation is really important as well. So I often hear um, talk of healthy food, which is great, I, but I think sometimes, and I've heard from many of the young people who've experienced food insecurity myself, is sometimes that bringing it back to healthy food can be a turn off and it should be based around choice. But people have the choice to have healthy food, but actually lots of the kids that I work with, they love a KFC, but they can't afford a KFC. So it should be about people having the choice, food banks, emergency food provision, shouldn't need to exist. If it needs to exist, there should be healthy options there. But I think we need to come back to how we frame that conversation and it should be about people having the choice to um, buy and eat the food that they want to eat. Yeah, can I just follow up on that? Because I think it's really important that we move uh, the governments uh, and nonprofits stop talking about um, uh, charity as a win win for reducing food waste. Uh, for example, that's a huge policy issue. Uh, tax credits for donations. These are things that, that governments who believe in you know, making food a right can do, is to not continue to entrench food banks and charities as the solution. Um, so, you know, and again, income security is the basic, the basic way in which we will make sure that people can afford enough food. Um, there's all sorts of other great things we can do around community building. We can make food banks and and grassroots organizations into better places, but we'll never ever solve the problem from there. So uh, we we need to really keep our eye on, as you say, reframing it so it's not about charity, it's about justice and about everybody having enough money to buy food, full stop. Brilliant. Well, I think that sounds like a great place to end, but I just wanted to thank you all for taking part in this webinar today. It's been absolutely fantastic. I've loved hearing from you all. Um, I just want to give you a chance. Is there anything else you want to sort of a final word that you want to say quickly before I sort of pass back to Emily, who's going to tell us about the next webinar? I just give you that chance if there's anything else you wanted to say quickly. I wanted to say thank you all for your conversation, especially I feel so bad for you, Miss Julie, having to go through what you went through with your sons. But thank you for sharing your, your testimony. Thank you. Yeah, I want to say thank you for sharing. I know how hard it is to share your story, especially like I don't know how many people are in this room, but it's really important. So um, I think you should feel proud. And that was really brave. Thank you. Great, thanks I so much like to you all. I'd just like to add those comments. It's been really good to hear from everyone, both the experts, but the other organization. Brilliant. Well, I think I'll hand back over to Emily now. I think she's going to tell us about the next webinar. Is that right, Emily? Yes. 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 Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, I will also echo a, a huge thank you to to everyone who participated in this discussion. It's been really enriching and so important to to build this dialogue across different countries. Um, as you all know, this uh, webinar has been part of, um, I guess, a four part series, which is sort of unmasking 
um, and, and repoliticizing, in a sense, the right to food narrative that um, is not really taking place, or human rights narrative in the in Europe and North America, as usually um, as part of our larger project to sort of reclaim and repoliticize human rights, um, which are usually relegated to something that's something only a problem of the global south. Um, that we really want to make sure our governments in in you know the quote unquote developed global north, which is not always the case, are also taking responsibility for keeping people poor, keeping people hungry, and and keeping and, and sort of entrenching this in in a much bigger system of oppression. And so part of this series, the last webinar will hold, is to also create a dialogue not only with this analysis around the rise of charity and food banks as a as a false solution to hunger and poverty. Um, in uh, North America and Europe, but also to make uh, make sure that we're starting to, to build convergence around these issues and, and creating a dialogue with this side of the analysis, as well as the very, um, uh, I would say, evolved and also well-organized discussions happening around food sovereignty and the right to food from the production side of, of the food system. So um, the next webinar we will have next week on June 27th, we'll start to bring these people together. So people will be I'm um, speaking from the food sovereignty movement, both in the U.S. and, and the European um, Mealeni Forum, as well as people um, working in um, community food programs in, in North America and the U.K. as well. So you have the link here, and we'll also be sharing this with everyone via email, along with the recording of today's webinar. Thank you. So I guess, I don't know, Kaylee, if you wanted to say anything else or we just want to close here? Yeah, we can close. So just, just want to say thank you for everybody who's um, taken part in the webinar today. And obviously, just finally, again, just thanks to all our brilliant speakers. And yeah, thanks to you, Emily, as well, for organizing everything, keeping us right. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. and we